Okay, I, I guess we should all uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is David Hyatt. I, I uh, live down in Cardigan, um, and I, I, uh, I'm trying to get 400 people their jobs back by making jeans. Uh, my town uh, used to have Britain's biggest jeans factory, um, and at the moment we've got 15 people working. So we've got a project called 385, trying to get those people their jobs back. So that's what I do. Um, I run a thing called the Do Lectures, which happens in uh, West Wales last week, and. California and uh, Costa Rica and Melbourne. So I do that in my spare time. So but you, you've just uh, introduced yourself. So. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Neil Condon. I'm a, a patent attorney. I work for the firm uh, EIP. So EIP is a law firm that specialises in intellectual property. And what do we do? Well, we protect our clients' innovation by f preparing and filing patent applications for them and trademark applications and, and registered design applications. So I, EIP was a startup once. It started 15 years ago with one person. Uh, in that time period, it's, it's expanded. There's now 130 of us. We have offices in London, Cardiff, Bath and Leeds in the UK, and in Dusseldorf in Germany. And recently, we're very proud to have opened an office in San Diego in, in the US. Uh, and as well as having the type of people, the type of lawyers that obtain IP rights for you, we also have IP solicitors who can help out if it comes time, unfortunately, to enforce your, your IP rights. Myself, I'm a patent attorney and I specialize in electronics and physics inventions and spend a lot of my time thinking about mobile phones and how they work and how I can protect them. Thanks, Neil. Uh, my name is Martin Brassel. I'm the chief executive of a company called Ingot, which is based in Swansea. Uh, we are also involved in the intellectual property space, but a slightly different part of it. We focus on commercial services. So what we do is to help businesses to identify, to manage, and also to value the intellectual assets that they've got. And uh, my other claim to fame or notoriety, if you like, is we have a particular interest in finance how you actually leverage these kind of assets to be able to get investors or lenders or other nice people with money to take you more seriously. Um, so if you fancy a bit of light reading, uh, give me a card later and I will send you through the PDF link to this wonderful tome uh, published by Beers and the Intellectual Property Office a little while ago called Banking on IP, which is the first time that this subject has really been thoroughly examined. And uh, money is usually of interest to people, I find, on these occasions. So do let me know. And it's, it's much more digestible and it comes in a PDF. Brilliant. Uh, my name's Dan. Um, I specialize in startups. I um, founded the Genie Lab, um, Blurt, and also a new project called Digital Profile, um, and building teams and securing investment. OK. Um. Okay, I mean, I, I just found out like a minute ago that I'm chair, chairing this. I don't actually know what a chairman does, but I kind of like, I think if we try and encourage everyone to uh, ask some uh, questions, that would be probably a good idea. But uh, I guess um, for me, um, like the most innovative day of, uh, you know, in the, you know, the denim life was 140 years ago when uh, Mr. Strauss and Mr. Davis came up with uh, uh, and patented a riveted you know, five pocket Western jeans. So actually there hasn't been much innovation in jeans you know, for 140 years, so that I'm really interested in that. Um, the thing I, I, um, I'm interested in is ideas, and actually I do, I do genuinely believe ideas you know, can change things faster and cheaper than ever before. Um, uh, the, the question for me then is, uh, actually some of the best ideas are really awkward. Do you mean, and actually we don't like them at first. And so my question to the, to the panel is like, how do we um, innovate when actually sometimes they're born ugly and they become beautiful halfway through the life? And, um, and I guess that's the job of the entrepreneur to push on those things. So how do we not kill uh, those beautiful ideas um, at an early stage? Uh, because uh, there's some great examples of you know, post-it notes that you know, you know, got killed like, uh, at an early stage because somebody was really smart and said that would never work. So uh, that, that's, that's a question. Let's just open this up and say, look, how do we stop killing like dumb, crazy ideas that look dumb at the beginning and turn out beautiful at the end? 
Uh, well, from my point of view, and in starting startups, um, create, I've created some service ones, but the newest one, which is my digital profile, is quite a disruptive product. Um, and you could say that what I'm going to disrupt could be um, could annoy, piss off quite a lot of people. Um, and people have advised me some some of these people might be your friends, you know, and you have to get past that and see it just as a business opportunity and push it forward um, and think big, um, take it to a place where uh, these guys, you know, go above them, go beyond them, uh, use, use what they're doing wrong to your rights and, and push it forward. That's from my point of view. Hmm. Cool. Um, I've, I found some great quotes on the internet the other day about this, and unfortunately I can't remember a single one of them, <laughs> apart from the fact that um, one of them came from Einstein, and it seemed to be uh, that if an idea isn't crazy, then it's probably not a very good one, uh, which is heavily paraphrased. Um, I, I think timing is really important yes. in this, mm -hmm. in terms of what else is going on around you, and I, I think probably, just, just taking a very personal example in terms of when we first established Ingot, we were putting services relating to intellectual property on the web. Nobody else is doing that. And in fact, there's still not very many people doing it. Um, but sometimes an idea has to, uh, it, th the times have to come to the idea, yeah, almost yeah. as much as the idea bending with the times. Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a genuine conundrum, that one. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think it's about, if, if you're picking up something that um, has other resonance within the kind of, I don't know, without sounding overly pretentious, sort of zeitgeist, then I think that's a big thing. Yeah, and yeah, the, the thing is timing. Things, some, sometimes you're too early. And actually, you know, like, there were some really great ideas on the internet like 15 years ago, but there was no Wi-Fi. So it was kind of like they were way too early and spent a ton of money and failed. But, so timing is, is critical sometimes. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that point. And, and certainly, uh, from a patent perspective, what we find now uh, there's a lot of the more valuable patents out there are uh, quite mature. They're 13, 14, 15 yeah, yeah, years yeah. old, and, and it fits into that point. Mm. They were filed at the end of the 90s, before you had high-speed Wi-Fi, yeah. but covering ideas that could only then be implemented yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, at a level that consumers would engage with when mm. high-speed was available. Mm. Uh, um, I think that's, it's a really good question, Dave. And um, the, the modern, um, sorry, the, the, the sort of godfather of modern brainstorming is a, a chap called Alex Osborne. Um, and his books are just as relevant today as they were um, 30 years ago. Now, Alex said there's three stages to brainstorming, but most people don't get past stage one. So just think about this to see whether it's you. Um, Stage one of brainstorming is where you come up with all the obvious ideas. It's the ones that are credible. It's the ones that you think you can take, take forward. Stage two is where most people stop. Stage two is where the ideas start to become weird and wacky, and everyone starts saying, well, look, this is silly. We need to stop now. Stage three is the one that actually leads to something new. Stage three is combining the weird and wacky ideas from stage two with the sensible ones in stage one. And that's how you can come up with something totally new, something dis disruptive and, and something unique. And I think um, you have to be willing to fail. Um, if, if you want to create something new, that, that is part of the process. They're not, success and failure aren't opposites. And there's a, a great mm. quote that it gets it across that winners fail more times than losers even try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a really good um, sort of thought because I think in Wales, we're not very good at failing, actually. Yeah. And I think we've got to get much better at it. And by that, I mean, actually, we're kind of like frightened to look foolish. We're frightened like to sit on the stage and say the wrong bloody thing. And actually, it's all right. And it's all right to like mess up. And it's all right, it's all right to look like a prat. And it's all right to do something that just fails on its ass. Do you mean? Because you just go, actually, out of that, beautiful failure, something incredible is going to come, because actually there is no failure, there's only learning. And I think, uh, so I think, like, how do we create a culture where it's okay to fail? Because, you know, the government is worried about it, you know, like, you know, the media are going to write about it, social media is very good at spreading, you know, you know like, you know, bad news. And actually, so the entrepreneur has to wear a very big vest. I mean, it has to be, you know, armor-plated and bulletproof. 
And I, I just how do we create a culture where actually like failure has a stigma, but in America it, it has less stigma. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Claire from Net Support UK. Um, so how do you take your staff effectively on your IP journey and, and through innovation in particular? Obviously, entrepreneurs are um, the one thing, obviously, to in encourage you know, more members of staff, and that may be one or two or you know, 50, 5,000. But how do you take staff along on that, that intellectual property journey and ensure that they're following your innovation as well? Um, for me, it's just a, a really quick answer, and it just goes back to what I said before. It, it's about allowing people to know that they can fail, and there's no repercussions. I, I think people have to be willing to have a go. If they're not in that environment, then how, how can you come up with anything new? Yeah. I think um, you know, trust breeds magic. And if you can build a team, and when they, guess what? It's really hard to build teams because uh, um, it, it just is. But I think if you can like, trust... I mean, obviously, you've got to hire right. But, I mean, if you can trust them and actually don't judge them when actually things don't work out because things won't work out sometimes. So I think trust breeds magic. I think that's maybe a good answer, actually. I think education is important as well. And I think amazingly, we, we still come across companies that think they don't own any IP, that they don't do anything that generates IP, uh, when, in fact, most companies do. And I think there's still a lack of knowledge about the different types of IP that you know, patents protect inventions and, and designs protect the appearance of products and trademarks are about protecting brands, uh, copyright protects artistic work. So certainly if you engaging with people and educating them and making them understand that these different types of IP exist is important. And also from a, from a, on, on a patent perspective, quite often you find that people overestimate the degree of inventiveness that you need to come up with an idea that, that's patentable. Uh, and engineers are very much like that. They solve a problem. It might be a very long-standing problem, uh, a problem worth solving, but they, they can dismiss it and say, oh, it's easy. Anybody could have done that. You know, that can't possibly be patentable. When, in fact, it very well might be patentable. Mm. Uh, and many people have lost rights by doing something good and then assuming it, it's not protectable when it is. So education for me is, is very important. Hmm. I'm not sure if it's 100% true, but <clears throat> I like the story that I got told the other day by somebody from Google, which was that if you join Google as a programmer, you get access on day one to the entire code base of everything that Google's doing, which is really bringing out, if it's true, your trust point in space. Yeah, yeah. Because that, they're not aware of any, any other organization that deals in computer software anywhere that will put that a level of trust in a new employee. Um, one quick observation, just to build on what Neil was saying, is that the law is kind of on their side because software is protected by default by copyright as a literary work. And if it's being developed by employees of your business, um, then you will be entitled to the fruits of their labors. Uh, at least that's the, that's the um, underlying fundamental position. So that's a helpful thing for you to know and probably for them to know as well. Yeah, and just to add to that, I agree as well. The trust, the trust thing's massive. I've got my team here with me today that I've just started for, for digital profile. Um, hi team, <laughs> um, and I, I, I give these guys the freedom to go and think in a room. I think, I think your talk earlier on was absolutely right. Sometimes just switching off and putting the computer down, going in a room and getting out from, from the mess of code, what we deal with, and letting them breathe and think is sometimes where the best ideas come from. Um, and what I say to my guys is throw the rule books out the window we're trying to think new, trying to think big, trying to do something different. And just because it's done something done one way by bigger companies doesn't mean it's the right way. Go and create something new, think about new, think about a different solution. So that's why we, we try and approach things differently. Hmm. I mean, the other thing about ideas that we don't talk about uh, so often is actually the importance of execution. Hmm. Like, like, um, like, the thing, you know, talking about the iPhone is like they executed insanely well, I mean, you know, everything from the glass to, you know, you know building the hub. So, you know, how do we, you know, we, we have respect for ideas. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty universal. 
Um, but as important as ideas is like how they're executed. And you know, from, you know, obviously from a patent, I mean, that's, that's slightly different because I'm talking about like the aesthetics of, like you were saying about how you set you know, your marina up, is you're thinking about everything that they, they're doing from how they have a coffee to if they don't you know, stay fit, they're not thinking. Do you mean? So, so creating the space, having the idea is one thing, but execution is incredibly important. I mean, how do we become, uh, how do we become better executors? Uh, well, there's a question at the back, which I'll just, uh, from my point of view on that, um, again, I, what I found is that if you don't have the right team, it is hard to execute. Um, from creating something that was just generally from a startup where we survived for 50p trying to get something to work for months, yeah. um, to now in the position where I've got a large pot of funding and I can, I can get the team that I need, uh, there's two different circumstances that you're in there and mm. you have to... Um, you have to be able to, one, trust in your guys. I think that comes back to the point. Mm. But uh, when you're starting something completely from scratch, um, it is difficult to even, like I didn't have the skills, the raw skills at first. So yeah. uh, my, my thing was that I had to pay a student with a bottle of vodka to teach me how to do something to start off with. And it worked. And it got me where yeah. I was. And that's why I'm sat here now for a bottle of vodka. So <laughs> it, it right. things, things, some things do work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Um, quick question. So my co-founders and I have uh, had conversations about uh, when do you want to go down the protecting your IP route? Because there's, you know, there's, there's an overall sort of thing out there that you've got to be a Google or an Amazon or somebody to, to be able to go through the process because ultimately you've got to have deep pockets if you ever want to protect yourself against something. So for a, for a small or medium-sized business, how do you go through the thought process about saying, yes, this is something that we need to protect? Uh, how do you kind of make that happen for a, for a smaller business? Well, I think from a, from a patent, you know, dealing with patents first, I mean, it's absolutely essential that you do make that decision before you make your invention public. Uh, otherwise, you can preclude the, the possibility of having a, a valid patent uh, for that idea if you've actually told people about it publicly before, before the patent application is, is filed. Uh, again, the point when you decide to file, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Filing early can be too difficult as well. It's a bad idea to file an application before the idea has been thought out properly, uh, particularly if it can't be implemented yet. But I think, and again with startups, what they find is that you know, their direction can change quite quickly. Uh, and what seems a good idea one day, even three, four months down the line, they can be going a different route. And it would be a shame for them in the meantime if they have then spent uh, a fair bit of money getting a patent application filed. How much do they cost to have a patent these days on average? I know the yeah, different. It, it, I mean, it varies okay. from technology to technology. Okay. Uh, but I mean, roughly speaking, to have a, a patent attorney prepare and file yeah. a UK application yeah. for you, you'd be looking at around £5,000 huh? upwards. Not, not crazy then. Yeah. Yeah. So if, it's, if you've got a back of an envelope design, I, I would think carefully about going ahead. But if you've got an idea that you think has got commercial legs and potentially could be valuable, then at that point you should certainly be thinking about filing a patent application before you, you go public with it. Registered designs are somewhat different. Registered designs protect the appearance of articles. And you really shouldn't be looking to file a registered design until you, you've got a product that you're, you're ready to launch and you know this is what it's going to look like when it hits the shops. Um, if you file registered designs, early prototypes, things can change considerably and then you end up protecting something that doesn't really look like what you actually end up commercializing. Um, I'd like to just build on a couple of those points that Neil's made. So. Um, Starting off with the registered design one, the rather nice thing about that is the first five years of protection, the official fees are 60 pounds. 
Uh, now, you'll need a little bit of help in order to be able to create drawings that uh, will give you the best protection under registered design, and you don't want to go down the route of submitting CAD drawings or photographs because you'll fall into exactly the trap um, that you just outlined, Neil, which is the moment that you change the appearance of the product slightly, you might stick yourself outside the scope of your own design protection. Yeah. So there are some very affordable routes that you can go down. Um, I think the most important thing that any business can do that doesn't theoretically cost any money at all is to be good at keeping a secret. Um, partly because you don't want to prejudice the opportunities for patenting or getting other protection first, but also because you know when you're doing something that's quite early stage in particular, if you let the idea get out there too widely, then obviously you may find that somebody with deeper pockets, as you were saying earlier, might, might beat you to it. <clears throat> but I, I guess the, the main point I'd want to stress, in a lot of the conversations that we have, particularly with quite young businesses, firstly, they tend to conflate, in other words, sort of mix up or think they're the same thing, patents and IP. And IP is a much, much broader family than patents, which is important to understand. Because then the conversation otherwise goes on to, well, there's no point in me going down the patenting route because I can't afford to protect it. And it's a very real concern that obviously you could come across people who have very deep pockets and they can be quite hard to come up against. But to me, the analogy I'd make is if you decide consciously not to go down the route of any IP protection because you don't think you can afford the legal costs, <clears throat> it's a little bit like saying, well, it's 25 degrees below out there. Uh, I've got a coat with me, but it's a bit thin and it probably won't be warm enough, so I think I'll just go outside in my T-shirt. You know, wh what you're doing is you're saying, I'm consciously choosing not to have any protection or any bargaining chip in this at all. And to me, even if you're not certain that the protection that you've got is going to be sufficient to be able to cover all possible eventualities, the key thing that it still gives you is it gives you a bargaining chip. It gives you something to be able to potentially negotiate with somebody else who may be doing something overlapping. So I, I would urge you not to regard the potential large costs of legal action, which you know, can be pretty big, uh, to put you off the idea of starting out on the IP journey, because I think, frankly, it's, it's a poor excuse. Hmm. Um, actually, I've got a question for you guys, since you're the experts in IP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, so, um, in terms of what I do is more software based um, and what I've always been told is protecting stuff in the UK is very different to the US um, and basically there are a lot more kind of, there's less things you can do to protect your code um, or what you're building. Can you explain a little more what is available from a kind of a software point of view of what is available out there in the UK? Sure. <coughs> I mean, again, this is a point that's come up for me several times today in, in conversations downstairs, but people, and a lot of people still have the assumption that software per se just isn't patentable in the UK. Uh, and that's not true, and it, it's never been true. Uh, it's just that certain types of software isn't patent protect, protectable in the UK. And the type of software that is patent protectable in the UK is the software that provides some type of, what the patent office call it, a technical effect. So to give a very obvious example, if you have a, a, you know, a computer machine that's programmed to control a piece of machinery and it, it makes that machinery work in a, in, a, in a particularly efficient way, like a novel and inventive way, you know, that's clearly technical. And from a patent perspective, the fact that really it's being implemented by software is, is neither here nor there. Another example would be in image processing. So you take a signal, it could be representing a photograph, could be noisy, you process it, you put, run it through an algorithm to re remove that noise and you end up with a better photograph at the end of it. If that algorithm is new and, and inventive compared to what's known at the time, then in, in as far as that algorithm is protected to image processing software, then it, it's protect, protectable. But where you do run into difficulty is with purely business software and administrative software where it's kind of a numbers in and a numbers out with just a bit of maths being, being performed. So you know, something that like calculated a pension scheme or, or, or like that. So not really technology and those type of innovations, as clever as they can often be, they're seen as being business improvements and not technological improvements. Um, 
In the United States, traditionally, it's been easier to patent software there than in the UK. So traditionally, some of the inventions that we see that wouldn't be protectable in Europe might be protectable in the US. Uh, but even more recently, there have been trends in their court decisions which seems to be shifting the law closer to in alignment to that in Europe. So it, it seems to be becoming even more difficult there. Um, just very quickly to pick on, up on one point that's implied by a question. Uh, one of the things that we come across when we do IP audits in companies quite frequently is that organizations understandably have used third parties to fill in parts of their product or service offering that um, they haven't got the in-house resources to be able to produce themselves. A classic example is a piece of software. And the only point I'd like to make is you've got to recognize that software ownership, um, the copyright in that software ownership resides with the people who originally created it um, unless there's some kind of assignment been put in place to the contrary. Uh, sounds like a kind of narrow technical point, but actually it's a bit broader than that. So basically it means even if you pay somebody to develop a piece of software for you, it doesn't necessarily follow that you own the copyright in it until you get an undertaking from them to the contrary. And I would strongly advise people to think about that. Um, it's not usually a difficult thing to negotiate, um, but it is important because come the glorious day when somebody walks through the door with a large blank check to buy your business, when they start going through the due diligence, one of the things they'll be asking is, how much of this stuff do you actually own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you don't want to be caught out at that point, trust me. I mean, uh, it is an important point. And uh, when you build a business and uh, you know, somebody comes knocking on your door with a large checkbook, they'll ask this question and in terms of IP, I mean, I haven't experienced some of this, is, you know, is it clean? And, and by that, it's like, are, are you protected? And, and, and your valuation will go down if you're not protected. And, and that's just like a, a complete fact because they want to know they're buying something with a moat around it. Um, I mean, uh, so one question like for, for, the, for the panel is like, so, so we have ideas and we have innovation. Like, how, how, what's the best way to go and raise money for those ideas? How, did you, how do we raise money in Wales? Shall I start? Yeah. Um, it, it, if you're looking at something very early stage, <clears throat> I, I don't want to duplicate things that have already been said in the finance stream, so um, apologies if any of this is a bit obvious. But until you get to the point where you're developing a reasonable amount of cash and you can afford loan repayments, the only way that you're going to get any joy out of a bank is almost invariably going to be if it's off the back of your own personal financial credentials rather than anything to do with your business. <clears throat> so normally the first port of call is some kind of equity investment for that reason. If it's anything that requires significant investment in order to get it off the ground, and normally that starts with um, friends and family, and sometimes the, the other F, which I won't mention. Um, but I think the really interesting development, which maybe other people want to comment on, is the fact that now with the three different types of crowdfunding that are available, yeah. which are gathering in pace fairly substantially, I think the, the brilliant thing about both the rewards-based and the equity-based type of crowdfunding, in other words, you, you either sign up and get free stuff, or um, you actually end up buying a share in the company, is that smart businesses have found that this is a brilliant way to be able to get your first customers, identify who they might yeah. be. And that kind of initial traction is something that's very hard for businesses to get. So I think that <clears throat> there's a lot of promise in that approach. I know that there, there is some activity in Wales around crowdfunding specifically. There's more that's been previously discussed. I'm not quite sure where it's at at the moment. Hmm. And the one thing to watch is that certain crowdfunding models can really muck up your equity structure big time and put off the possibility of being able to raise serious cash in the future. So some care is required, but I do like that upside of being able to get over mm. that initial hurdle. How, sure how do they answer the question? Yeah, no. How do they mess up the uh, the, the, the 
share structure? Well, the, the, the problem that you have, and, and this has largely been solved in some of the newer models which have taken this problem on board, is when crowdfunding first came out, you would end up with a myriad of tiny shareholders who might collectively add up to having quite a substantial overall stake in the company, depending right. on how much of it you were selling. Yeah. What then happens is that it becomes impossible or very, very difficult to manage that shareholder population that's not yeah, really yeah. directly engaged with or very committed to your business. Yeah. Um, so having lots and lots of very small shareholders is complex. I mean, obviously, if you're a PLC, you have made ways of being able to deal with it, mainly because they don't own a big enough proportion of your business to be able to affect your decision-making process very much. Mm. Um, but that's, that's the danger to be aware of. It's, it's generally now done using different classes of shares, some of which do and don't have voting rights, yeah, yeah. or you do it by having some kind of nominee account, so somebody central can act on behalf of the other shareholders. So there are ways around it, but it's still a care point, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good point. You want to talk about raising money? Just yeah. Uh, well, from my experience, I've been through several different investments, S4C, uh, private investors. Uh, for me, um, there's been different. I've been at different stages within that journey of, of the startup process, uh, raising capital. Um, sometimes we've had the beta version, so you can kind of get a valuation done on that and then release some of that uh, with equity. Um, uh, the other, the other routes. What, what, what I've done really is focused on myself as the one selling it and having the passion for that idea to then represent that to private investors. And normally if you can show that you're passionate and drive and you're completely focused and you actually got a good idea. So, yeah, I've found that I've been able to convince someone to hand over their money, but I think that's just my sales boy. <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah, like, I mean, obviously the idea is important, but like, you know, ultimately you're going to be investing in people. Yes. Because, you know, if, if they quit, then your, your, your investment's worth nothing. So yeah. it has to be an investment around people. So. Certainly the crowdsourcing aspect of things, that's very interesting. And, and you know, in the last few years, we've seen a number of, of, of clients who've raised money uh, using that particular route. Uh, again, on, on top of the, the kind of the business angels and, and VC routes that have already been talked, uh, for very early stage, and I think I think it's the techno technology strat uh, strategy board uh, offer a scheme where you can apply for innovation vouchers. Uh, and I think if you can get one of those, then they will provide funding, and I think it's up to £5,000 that can help uh, finance protecting the IP. Okay. Have, uh, in an idea. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm more of a um, bootstrapping type of person. I think... Um you don't want to raise equity too too early. Uh, if you've got complete belief in your, in your idea, why would you want to um, give too much of it up at, a, at an early stage? Um, I, I've gone through all the, the different things of setting something up with, with nothing and just doing it myself to having in, in investors. And, and, and they both have pros and cons. It, yeah. Again, a lot depends on what industry you're in. Um, in the digital world now, to get something going, you really don't need equity. You need um, collaborators. Um, you, you can get something to a reasonable point without a great deal of money, and that's why I love being in the sort of um, te tech sector. Um, I think the Welsh government um, is, is knocked a lot, but uh, every single startup that I've had has received substantial funding from the Welsh government. Um, it is a lot of work, but it has to be. That's our money that they're investing. Um, and if you've got a real idea, then, then do it. Start off with some of the smaller funds are there, like the innovation vouchers. Um, the Digital Development Fund is a fantastic fund um, that will support projects up to 100,000 match funding. There's um, the smart um, uh, funds there as well. So, you know, the, the, there are funds out there where you don't have to, to give up equity at an early stage. But when, once you can see your idea and concept has really got legs and it's running and it's got value, that's the stage where, where you know, you want to get investors on board. Um, but obviously, if it's a different type of industry that needs a lot of upfront cash, then, yeah, then yeah. obviously you have to, to consider that as well. Yeah. Um, the... Um, sure. I guess the, you know, that thing of you know, the most expensive equity you can give away is at the beginning because ultimately you have no track record, you have no data to say that this is going to fly. 
So um, if you can bootstrap it, you know, there's an art to bootstrapping, and uh, it does certainly, if you can get through the first three years and, and uh, keep most of the equity yourself, then you know, then you know, then you can give you know people shares when um, they have to pay much more for them. So that the, you know, the, there's a case for bootstrapping. There's also a case for sometimes if you have an idea, you have to be able to go and land grab as quickly as you can because somebody else with deeper pockets will get there. And you know, so some sometimes, especially in tech, I guess um, you know the speed of getting getting there first is. Um, uh, really important. Like, who cares if there's a better Instagram than Instagram? Because they've they've land grabbed. Um, so, um, is there any more questions on the from the audience? Um, anybody wants to desperately to ask something to the panel? Any hands anywhere? Um, okay. Um, I think um, yeah. So we've covered a little bit of money and stuff. I mean, I, I don't know a, a ton about intellectual property, um, but I, I mean, I, I did uh, uh, James Dyson's uh, brand book for, for some reason. He asked me to do that, and um, uh, I know that he was protected, um, but he still had a big fight with um, Hoover because they just literally went and ripped his idea off. I mean, like, you know, they didn't have any problems sleeping at night. Do you mean they just went <laughs> wholesale, just copied it? Um, and you know the, the point earlier about like somebody's going to go and copy you with deep pockets, but like actually, if you're, you know, even with deep pocket, pockets, actually, like James Dyson um, still fought Hoover and won because he was protected, and 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 uh, uh, you know, the argument of you know it's going to cost you a lot of money to um, uh, get get protection. It is a bit nonsensical because you're going to go and spend 20 years building something, and and if you don't, if you're not protected, you have no value. So, I think you should always get protection. Do you mean um, as much as you can? I think that's completely correct, and I mean I think you don't want to end up in patent litigation. It's a terrible place to be. Uh, it's expensive, uh, and you require a whole lot of cash to be able to do it. Which, yeah. which by that point in his business development, Dy Dyson could do. Uh, yeah, but he still he was very. I mean, he was very open about it. He was very. He was on the brink, one day away from like going under. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's. I a, mean, if you well, one of the primary reasons for being involved in patent litigation, it, it's bet the farm. You're doing yeah, it because yeah, you yeah. have to do it, and if you don't, yeah, uh, you're going under. Uh, but the traditional view of of, of getting patents, uh, with a view then to enforcing them, it, it, it is slightly old-fashioned. Mm. You know, I urge clients, don't think of patents in, in, in that, in yeah, that yeah, light. Yeah. You know, they're, they're assets, they, they can be bought, they can be sold, they add value, you can license them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got the patent box, so if you, in the UK, if you have a UK patent or a European patent uh, that, that covers a product, then you can get reduced corporation tax on worldwide okay. sales. I mean, there are lots of reasons why okay. patents add value to your business and encourage people to invest in it. Mm. And, and, and those are the reasons for doing it. And maybe one day, having done that and had investment, you will find yourself in a position where you've got deep enough pockets mm. to defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and um, beyond the investment point, which is an important one, um, there's two or three other stats that you might find interesting. Um, last week, there was a, a report brought out by the Federation of Small Businesses who'd done a survey around IP. Um, which is a first time in a while, I think, they've looked at the subject. And they concluded that of their sample, they had 30% of businesses who knew that they did own some IP, and their estimate was that 75% or more of their revenue was wholly dependent on that IP. So in many modern businesses, IP is the key driver of income. So that makes it sound pretty important. Um, it's also very clear from the statistics that uh, we can see that get gathered regularly by ONS that nowadays inter intangible assets as a whole, including intellectual property, is the thing that companies now spend more money on than anything else. I mean, and the difference is now very, very marked. So uh, back in the 1990s, there was a tipping point where companies started to spend more on what you might collectively think of as being knowledge assets than they did on hard fixed assets like plant machinery and so forth. And that trend continues to escalate. And it survived the recession a lot better than the spending on fixed assets as well. So 
it's how you earn your money, it's also what you spend your money on, and perhaps the most compelling thing of all is it's what is going to dictate ultimately what your business is going to be worth. And um, a little bit of evidence of that. It's easiest to see with quoted companies. This is the extent to which the knowledge economy is now taking over. So back in 1975, if you were to look at the S&P 500, 500 of the biggest and most influential companies in America, you would find that 80% of their market value was based directly on hard things that were on their balance sheet. If you do the same test now, obviously with different companies, the total amount is 16%. So the 80-20 rule has got completely reversed in that time. That's the level of dependency that the world's most successful companies, or many of them, now have on intellectual property and other types of intangible assets. So um, if you thought it didn't apply to you, um, chances are it does. Uh, in fact, the, the, the best quote I heard recently on this was, um, it was quoted by a chap from the intellectual property office. I'm not entirely sure where he got it from, although he assures me it's genuine. And he attended a presentation where somebody said, if you are selling just on price, you are now dead in the water. And if you're not selling just on price, then you must have some kind of IP. So that sounds like a pretty good test for seeing whether it's relevant to you. Mm. Yep. Um, the, only, the, the only thing I've, uh, just to bring it back to the equity thing, there was something I just wanted to pick up. One of, one of my first mentors, the fir one of the first things he taught me is Alfred Gooding quite a well-known Welsh businessman. And he turned around to me to, uh, one day and he said, Dan, owning 10% of something that's worth a million pounds is a lot, lot more than owning 100% of nothing. And I've, that's stuck with me ever since, basically. So don't mind sharing shares as long, long yeah. as it, there's, uh, there's no, a worth in there. And, and the thing is that, you know, we, uh, as entrepreneurs, we crave ownership and independence. But if you, if you don't have the money to execute on, you know, as well as you want, uh, and, and to be able to scale it, it, it's, it is that thing of, well, yeah, we own a lot of something that's incredibly small. And, um, and actually, you know, the biggest change comes from the mainstream, so you, know, you have to find some way to get there. Uh, and, and there will be a point where you, you, you need some kind of investment to, to in order to enact that. Uh, I, I take that point of, um, you know, like, innovation and ideas add, like, um, you know, value, and the thing is, if you're if you're not innovating, then you have to follow, and following is a really hard game, and uh, and um, and uh, we we live in this world now where actually, you know, we, we can go and set, set up you know uh, amazing spaces for companies to go and create, because you know, um, you know, like one in ten of them is going to win. Um, there's, a, there's a great school in uh, <coughs> Silicon Valley called Y Combinator. I mean, how many people know about Y Combinator? It's pretty, um, it's been pretty successful and it's, it's changing now with startup schools that are, are doing it in America. And they've started things called like, like Dropbox and Airbnb and a bunch of others. And it's a school that um, they pay you to go to but they take a share in your company and they take a 7% stake in your, your company. And they, take, they pay you $18,000 to go. And it, it's two terms, they have a spring term and an autumn term and 60, 60 new companies go there. So, and I think that's, you know, you know, I guess that's what you know, you, you, you're doing you know, down on the marina is that we've got to create that innovation um, culture because uh, following's like hard. Like, and you're gonna have to be cheaper and if you're going to be cheaper, like, pff, man, that's a tough game. I mean, the reason the jeans, the old jeans factory, you know, sort of closed and 400 people lost their jobs was they fought the battle of who could be the cheapest, and, and it wasn't Cardigan, it was China. And and you go, you know, once you once you're picking the wrong fight, you know, you, you kind of you're in trouble really. So I mean, uh, what what kind of things have been inspiring, you know? you in terms of your fields, uh, you know, you know I, I look up at companies and I go, wow, that, I sort of benchmark companies and I see what other people are doing, so I see Y Combinator and I'm going, wow, that's pretty interesting. And um, when I was reading a book about it, like on page 37, this guy, David Lee, he, he, his job is to go and give every startup $150,000. That's his job. It's a hard job. 
And, but uh, because they've worked out, actually, they didn't know which one was going to be the next Dropbox. And they're so smart, they've worked out they're not smart. And, uh, and uh, the reason his name was like, stood out to me is that he hounded me uh, to invest in Hyatt. And I, and I didn't know who he was, and I found out later. Um, so, you know, you know, even like little startups in West Wales making jeans can be like hounded by, you know, those savvy people out there. So, um, so who, you know, I've seen Y Combinator and I've benchmarked them. Like, in your world, you know, which, which things are, you know, are you benchmarking? Um, the, I've been to, I was lucky enough in 2011 uh, to go over to MIT and oh. Harvard. Cool. Um, and what I saw over there was two different concepts. One, uh, MIT, all about innovation and open source, and I thought it was absolutely amazing. Not so much chasing the money, but chasing the idea and being innovative. Yeah. Um, when I went to Harvard and experienced that side of it, it was about commercialization of a product and how they invest in new startups and the talent that they go to that, those schools and put them in, in their, what, what was the, the new media lab at the time and push them forward and, tr and basically try and get back something back for the university as well. All that money would go back um, into the university to reinvest into new ideas. And that's like the likes of Facebook was in Harvard and so on. Um, and I thought that that doesn't exist over here and it needed to. And mm. I don't know how you get that over here, but that, mm. that was an inspiring place to go to. Okay, that's cool. Gosh, there are so many. I mean, I, I, I meet businesses almost every week that really impress the socks off me. Um, but I suppose to pick a few obvious ones, um, I'm always amazed at Apple's ability to half surprise <laughs> um, and the way that they managed to make even quite incremental levels of innovation appear fantastically important and must have devices. Obviously, they've got scale. Yeah. But I think I, I'm probably more fascinated in a way by some of the old kind of giants, if you like, in the technology space in particular, like IBM, and what they've done to radically re-engineer their entire business model around a, a totally different set of presumptions. I mean, I, I can't imagine what that board meeting must have been like, where somebody did the presentation and said, you know this hardware stuff? Yeah, we're going to forget that, we're going over here. But uh, it must have been someone quite senior, I guess. Yeah, I guess they, they saw like a vertical line going in the wrong direction and went, oh, I think we might have to change. I mean, that's, that's always a good um, precursor, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, I think the world is changing and we have to change with it. And if that's a big company or a small company. Yeah, yeah for me personally, I mean, I'm a great, uh, just at admiration, some of the technical innovations that you know, people are able to come up with. And to use a, a kind of a local example, I forget his name now, it's gone from my mind, but it's probably not a well-known fact, but packet switching, which if there was one technology that underpinned the whole internet, it's, it's, it's packing, packet switching, cutting bits of data up and individually addressing them and sending them from one computer to another, right. uh, possibly by different routes, and, and then reassemble them at that computer. But that uh, concept was invented in the 1960s by uh, like the son of a Ronda miner. I think he'd moved oh, really? to England and was working in England at that point, but he was a computer scientist with you know, quite strong Welsh roots. Hmm. Uh, for an area which you know, has, has suffered, to be honest, in the last 40 years with the decline of traditional uh, manufacturing, now, you know, just with the power of thought and, and computer programming and coming up with ideas like that, hmm. You know, Interesting. Great, great businesses and technologies can, can be built from it, hmm. and, and anyone can do it. Yeah, well, yeah. Not, not anyone can do it, but it, it's, it, it's open to anyone. Cool. Chris. Thanks. Um, well, we've got, a, we've got a flashing red light here, so I guess this is... Uh, might, might mean something. Yeah, this is, this is uh, coming to an end, so I'll just make it brief. Um, there's <laughs> not, not a spe specific one for me. I just love every new startup. I just love reading about it, and I just think, gosh, how did somebody come up with that idea? We're, we're, we're in, an er in an era now where people can literally just start things up um, from scratch and instantly make a, 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 an impact on the market. So um, all, for me, that is fun. Creating things and seeing them flourish is, is absolutely amazing. Cool. Okay. So I think we. I don't know where. I think we're done in terms of the red flashing light has stopped. So I think that. Um, so thank you for your time and um, thanks everyone on the panel. So.
Okay.